Welcome to Real Wealth, Real Health, the show that empowers you with insights, information, and inspiration to achieve your version of financial wellness. Learn how to balance living a full life today with planning for the future. This podcast is brought to you by Alpha Investing, a real estate-centric private capital network that provides exclusive investment opportunities to its members. And now, here are your hosts, Ada Pia Dorico and Daniel Coca. Hello, welcome back to another episode of Real Wealth, Real Health. Today, I am speaking with wealth advisor, Jerry St. Cyr, who shares some of the most important considerations to keep in mind about retirement planning, long-term care insurance, and investing in today's market. He also explains why he's so passionate about helping women secure their financial independence and shares a preview of his upcoming book, Womanity, A Tribute to Women. In seasons of economic uncertainty, like now, it's more important than ever to have a solid financial plan. And in our conversation, we get Jerry's perspective on our current economic situation, why retirement planning needs to evolve, what to include in your financial plan, when to start investing in long-term care insurance, and investing in today's market. I hope you'll enjoy this episode. There are so many important gems and pieces of information here that should help ground you in these times of uncertainty and remind us all why having a financial plan, whether we design our own or we work with a professional, is so profoundly important to our sense of well-being and for our mental health. Hi, Jerry. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. I'm really excited to have this conversation with you today. You know, there's a lot going on in in the economy, in the world, in our emotions, in our portfolios. And as a wealth advisor, I just thought it'd be such a good time to talk to you and kind of ground into this concept of why having a financial plan and or working with somebody toward that plan, because it's a lot of work to have one, can come in kind of almost like emotionally handy right now. And so that's one thing that that I want to really unpack with you is this moment in time and what's going on and how to ground people into a sense of certainty um, in in these very turbulent times. And then we're going to talk about your book and Women's Equality Day on August 26th. But to get started, you know, we're, we're here in, in August of 2022, and we've just gone through some pretty big interest rate hikes. We're starting to see a lot of headlines about recession, and we're seeing really brutal stock market dip, and then a really good July, and people are calling me and saying, I can't look at my portfolio, you know, all these things. I'm sure it's happening to you, but, we did. you know. We, every day. So what's going on? Like, what is going on? How, how can we work with this to help ourselves not feel so out of control? Well, every point you brought up, I agree with, and that's an excellent question. So I'd like to just present one point to you that I speak to a lot of my clients about. The umbrella view of this is that when I speak to economists, specialists, portfolio managers, and so forth, they say and state that this is one of the most difficult periods of time to do an evaluation analysis of the economic situation of all the metrics of your portfolio over the last 60 years, which is pretty crazy. So you brought up a very good point. You talked about inflation. Then people are talking about stagflation. Then they talk about recession. Yeah. So even the top minds in the country, in the financial world, they're not even sure about, is it a stagnation? Is it an inflation? Is it a recession? So the underlying point here is that if you have a plan, then it really helps you to have a compass for your future days and for the horizon you have before you retire. Mm-hmm. Now, one thing I always talk to my clients about, 50 years ago, 60 years ago, people lived till they were 67 for men, 69 for women. Now you see, so what happened, they had pensions, right? Pensions. So someone would retire at 65, the man, for example, use a man in this case, and and then they'd have two years of of using their pension. Well, now today, 
a woman will live in this country till around 84.7 and a man to 82.3. So if you take a, just the pension, the retiring point of 65, you have essentially 20 years you have to live after retirement, which is why, by the way, so many people are retiring later than 65. Yeah. Many are retiring at 67, others around 70 years of age because they have a very long horizon in front of them and they have to ensure they have the money. So back to your direct question about planning, you know, people talk about their health. I'm planning for my health. I'm yeah. going to the doctors. I'm going to, to get a checkup and so forth. But many people are not really spending enough time planning for their retirement. The other thing that you and I've talked about in the past is, and this is very important to me fundamentally, is that the power of the purse of the strings of a purse or the power of the purse strings to me is very important. And so I work with a lot of women because I want them to become independent so that they better understand the financial tracks in, in front of them and also to understand the barriers in life. Women are more caring, generally speaking, mm -hmm. and women take time off oftentimes. It's either to have a child or children or to care for their families. So they have more at risk and they have more challenges in front of them. So one of the reasons I spend so much time presenting with my presentation, Women in Finance, is to try to educate as many as possible and really to underscore and underline the values behind the purse strings and why it is so important, especially to women. But planning in general is for both men and women, young and old. It's absolutely critical to ensure that you retire, as I always say, in comfort and with dignity. Yeah. I didn't realize that there was only, let's say, a two-year window between, back in the, so many years mm -hmm. ago, between retirement and, let's say, passing. Not to be morbid, but really, I mean, this is what it is. And we're 10x that. We went from two yeah. to 20. And I often, sometimes I have trouble really verbalizing it, but I get the sense that we're all operating on very archaic paradigms that are affecting us today because there is a segment of the population, like my parents certainly, who grew up with that and they carried it forward and they probably haven't adapted to that big gap because a 10x gap. And then if you factor in an inflation on like what like the the factor on the factor of what you actually need financially is a lot to put it simply it it's overwhelming and for somebody who is busy you know if we talk about women i mean there's so many other things going on caretaking being the nurturer being like working i mean there's this like thing that happened in the 80s where it was like the woman is everything. She was like empowered, but she was empowered to be everything to everyone. Like breaking out of that one role became, but you have to be excellent at all roles. So just as an aside, but to say that's a lot to take on mentally to think, Tremendous okay, amount. how do you even go there? I think a lot of people think maybe if I ignore it, like hope, you know, hope is not a strategy, but like there's just so much more and it gets pushed to the side and yet to your point and what we're talking about is we can't put it to the side because those are real issues that are going to affect us probably a lot sooner than we realize and for a lot longer. I love what you just said. One thing that's interesting about what you just presented is the following. One, life gets in the way and people don't focus on it because it's kind of quiet matter in one's life. It's not a health issue. I don't have a sore foot. I stub my toe or I have to go to the dentist. I crack my tooth. That's evident. The human mind says I have to address that immediately. Finances oftentimes, as you say, there's a hopeful side to it. There's ignoring it because it's so complex or it's so time consuming. But when you think of life and, and going through life, the planning factor is so critical because, as you well know, there is a tremendous percentage of individuals who have no savings today. Another uh, critical point is that after retirement, many people have nothing in their savings. Yeah. So that's why you have to have this plan. And of course, you want to start as early as possible. Yeah. 
And that's the thing is that when we're young, we think I got yes. time. And then we go from, I don't have to think about that. I'm, you know, younger than 20 into, well, I have to focus on college and my career and I have to really grow my career. And then it goes into family and looking for a house. And right now, if you're looking for a house, if you're in the housing market, I mean, that's like a full-time job basically. And navigating, like there's so much of the economics that, that are, I think, hitting home for people a lot more maybe than they ever have, or certainly, certainly the great financial crisis was one thing that brought some of the economics home. But I feel like this is like, it's, it's driving, it's driving more towards people's every day because a lot of us haven't lived through really high inflation because we, were, Absolutely we, just, correct. we just didn't. And so there's a level of this economics that's always been theoretical for a lot of people that is, that is now very real. So we're saying not me, not now, I don't have time. I don't have time. And then, and then, like you said, life gets in the way. And then all of a sudden we're 60 and we're feeling, well, oh shoot, well, I can't retire. And with advances in medicine, I'm sure that the age to which we're going to live is actually going to continue to push out. And, and that presents, even for me, when I think about that, I think, well, how long do I want to work for? How I want to live for inflation? How long do I want to live? I mean, I'm, I'm going to live for as long as I can, of course, but like, like then it comes into the long-term care aspect of it too, of like my mental health. And so there's, again, so then I'm clearly a very convoluted deep thinker, but it, there's so much there that even somebody listening to me right now is going to say, this is why I don't, (laughs) this is why I don't want to think about it because it's just so much to think about. And then I would remind myself and everyone else this is why financial planning exists. This is why wealth advisors exist. This is why there's an industry out there to help us. And really why I wanted to really bring you on to kind of ground this, because you've been doing this for a long time. You've been through multiple market cycles. Correct. You've been focused on legacy. And so I feel like you have a groundedness to you that I think a lot of people would benefit from, from hearing. Well, thank you for saying that. Adapia, you said something fantastic. You said it becomes very convoluted. My job is to take everything that is convoluted, intertwined. It's like extension cords that when you try to put them together, they get all intertwined. My job is to unravel it, simplify it, and as I my, my expression is, to distill it into a thimble so that we can all understand what needs to be done. Mm-hmm. For example, and I'm just going to enumerate a couple of very simple points. Does someone have, do you have life insurance? People go, no, no, I have it at work. Yes, but what happens if you get fired or you quit? You don't have life insurance. This is fundamental, right? It's the foundation of the financial house. Do you have money? Did you say, did you put a little bit of money over uh, away for three months? That'll carry you for three months or six months. What, what What happens with college funding with a 529, for example? What about if you use a whole life policy and life insurance and borrow from that and then it's tax-free and it doesn't have limitation? What about investing to make sure that there's growth? You you can be very conservative, but let's all remember that since the early 1900s, the average return of the S&P is 7.8%. So of course the stock market is like a roller coaster ride, but if you take the linear side of it, the average per annum is 7.8%. The other thing is, is that what we're seeing more and more, and you hit the nail on the head about five minutes ago, long-term care. I do a lot, a lot of work with women for long-term care. Why? Because between most of my clients who do long-term care are between 50 and essentially 65 years of age Mm -hmm. for affordability. The window, they they call the, the best time to do it is around 55 years of age. But let's talk about that for a second. You brought it up and I'm really glad you did. Mm -hmm. What happens is that, of course, women live longer, men die sooner, more women are left alone. They don't have the care. The other thing is because women are so kind and giving, when their husband is sick, the woman will take care of the husband. But oftentimes, if if the wife is sick, the men have it, it's not as easy for them. Because as you said at the very beginning, the whole nurturing side, nurturing side comes into play. So long-term care is to protect the monies that you've saved over time for exactly another point you spoke about is legacy play. Mm-hmm. How is it that you're going to save money and not spend all your money 
on long-term care and leave money for your, your children, your estate, you know, your favorite organization, that is absolutely critical. And if I may, I'm just going to add one thing that a, a lot of people are not cognizant about. Most of long-term care are, is, are for people, individuals, for help at home. It's not to go to an assisted living. That's not what people want. I would even submit to you that it's between around 89% get their care at home. So if you think about care in a lot and you go to assisted living, depending on where you are in the country, it can be $7,000 to $12,000 a month. Yeah. So long-term care alone is something that has to be looked at. But again, all of these points have to be, again, distilled into a thimble so that we can plan accordingly for life events so that each time we hit a life event, we can address it and we know that we've planned accordingly. Yeah, I really appreciate all of the various parts and the way that, you know, the way that you presented them. And there's a timeline, there are certain things that if I understood correctly, you said long-term care is something that most people think about in their fifties. Is it, that's a good time to think of it, or should we be thinking about it before in our forties? Or is that, is that too soon? Is that a waste of the, you know, I think there's like extra, like a fee or a rider or something that I'm certain costs more. Yeah, it's a good question. So usually people in their forties, they don't think about it because they're looking at, oh, I'm going to pay off my house, for example, or I'm going to add to the mortgages depending on the interest rate, obviously. But when, especially most of the clients I speak with, most of them are women for long-term care. Most of them are between, as I said before, 50 and 65. But in terms of being most affordable, it really is around 52 to 55 years of age. I speak to a lot of women who want long-term care because to answer your question directly, it's the affordability factor that comes into play. Yeah, yeah. I think it's hard too if I you know, continue down this thread to think, here's the thing as humans, right? We're like, I'm healthy today. You know, I'm, I'm good today. And then maybe something happens and, and you're not, which is always the point of insurance, I suppose. I mean, on a separate note, like I live in a really high risk fire area and I pay a lot of insurance to live here because there is this risk or like earthquake insurance in California, yes. like there's, you know, or we have car insurance because you never know. It's like, there's a peace of mind that comes with that for some kinds of insurance. And then there's this that we're talking about, which is more like a planning so that sometimes the illness can be sudden and it can be devastating. And other times, it, you know, it's maybe something that you know that maybe it's in your family. And I'm sure that the underwriters kind of take all of that into account. But, you know, if there's a way for people to think about this early enough, knowing that if I think about it on a timeline and I'm going to be around for a long time, like I will be praying every day that I stay in good health, right. but it's also very possible. You know, we invest in senior housing at Alpha. So we have a lot of senior housing facilities. And so we're relatively familiar with the operational aspect and the costs and, and everything like that, that, that go into it. And, but it can be sudden. And, and when it does come on, when we're older, it's harder to recover. And sometimes it can, you know, it can just, it can just kind of like start to spiral. So all of this to say that it might not be something we want to think about. And I don't think anybody wants to think about it, but probably, correct again, probably good to think about it sooner rather than later. And knowing that, you know, we have these really long timelines. So at a certain point, you're not going to be able to work. Not only are you not going to want to work, you're not going to be able to work. And right. I would rather stop working when I don't want to rather than when I can't exactly <laughs> and That's then have the point. enjoyment. Right. And then say like, if I'm going to live to be 120, I mean, I got really planned for that. I cannot agree more with you. The one, so a few points, people have talked about hundred year old individuals 60 mm -hmm. years ago, which was a, an absolute phenomenon mm -hmm. today. There are far more hundred year olds than there have ever been. So that's very important to highlight. Yeah. The other thing I want to share with you, because you brought up, Two very good points. I'm going to present to you three cases that have transpired over the last six months. I have a client invest with me. She has life insurance, investments, and annuity. Her mother, they, she, they discovered, the family discovered she started having Alzheimer's. She now found out that it's actually in the genes in her family. 
at the age of 58 years old, she got long-term care because she is fully cognizant of the fact that it runs in the family. So she planned based on essentially the genetics, right? Just as you said before. Case number two, I had a client, 57 years old. I said, you're alone now. Your husband passed away. You may want to look at long-term care. No, I'm in good health. Just found out she had breast cancer and called me up and said, can I get long-term care now? So that was case number two. Case number three, the person said, I'm 55 years old. You've been telling me about long-term care. It's the bailiwick of time to save money. No conditions in the family, does not want to take a risk, planned accordingly, and got, and, and got a long-term care plan at 55 years of, of age. He lives alone. He knows that. No children. That was absolute total planning on his behalf. Now, you have three different scenarios, and look what transpired. It's mm -hmm. extraordinary. You said it before. You said illnesses can creep up quickly, and that poor lady, it devastated me because I tried every which way to Sunday to get it for her after what was determined, and unfortunately, she could not get it. I mean, that... I from a business or insurance perspective, I would imagine that that makes sense. And then that's the thing. And then you end up looking at, well, how much do I have in savings? And, and then it'll completely alter your trajectory, I think. And these are really important conversations to have. These are the really important conversations we have to have with ourselves, with our advisors, with our family. And I know, especially for, if I think about, again, if I think about my parents, I mean, there's a generation of people that doesn't want to talk about these things. It's not okay for them to talk about these things. It's Correct. Like they don't want to go into the emotion of it. Or still today, my parents are much older and they still want to think that they would need to sh seem like they are the parents that know more and that are strong. <laughs> And that they're okay. And, and it's like, we have to be able to bring a level of vulnerability and openness to say like, there's a, that humanity in us that we have to ask for help. And we have to be willing to admit that we don't know things and to really sort of look really honestly at who we are and what we need. Because at the end of the day too, I think about this a lot. I think about me, but not just me. It's that I don't want to leave people in a bind because I was too proud to, to deal with something. I want to make sure that they're not going through it. You know, all, all these bad emotions and all these things that could come up because I had the foresight and I was willing to go into the discomfort of doing something. So to save them even more discomfort that comes with it. And I think that's also true of estate planning as insurance, as all these things that, that go together. And then, I mean, I always bring everything back to that level of self-awareness and, and self-knowledge so that, you know, I'm doing the best for myself and I'm doing the best for the people around me, because I feel that that's really to me, legacy and generational wealth. And all of it is really like that leading by example too. Yes. Yeah. Those are very good points. Very good point. I have a client now, she just turned 88. She was living in her home. She just moved to assisted living mm -hmm. and she was too old to get long-term care when she became my client. So we structured a portfolio for her so that we ensured that she would get dividends and it would be value investing, not growth to protect mm -hmm. her. We did bonds and so forth. So we established that within the next six, seven, eight years, she was going to need care, which in fact, she started this past Friday mm -hmm. and we just did an analysis of her monies. How much money is she going to take out every month? How much is it going to be complemented with social security? Perhaps this pension from her deceased husband. We put all these analyses together, came up with a plan yesterday morning uh, with, the, with her three daughters, and they're in good stead for you know, a number of years, which is wonderful. Yeah. And that's something that feels good. That's really where we want to get to is that I think we're all seeking that sense of security. That's really hard to find in a very uncertain world that really, I mean, it's throwing everything at us right now, but that, that inner sense of security. And I do think it comes from taking some action around the things that we know we're supposed to do, just like with our health, there's things that we all know we should do, but actually doing them so that, you know, we don't make it like an obsession because we're not going to get it right completely perfectly, but we're going to do our best. And I think it comes back to like what we've been talking about really since the beginning is this idea of planning. Again, like right now, we were talking before we hit record that 
people are feeling a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of fear in the atmosphere. Yes. And, you know, even though, I mean, you know, as well as I do that in times of uncertainty, there's great opportunities to invest. I mean, great yes. opportunities. Some of the greatest wealth is created when in bear markets and in opportunities, when you find the value, no, everybody's afraid to jump in. In fact, I was just reading Howard Mark's latest memo. And he was really talking about uh, really about this, about a, a very deep thinking about risk and not timing the market because investors don't time the market, traders do, but knowing what you're doing and making that choice with a lot of awareness and the value that can be found in these times of uncertainty. And so finding that place of that inner stability and saying, okay, well, I have a plan, I'm going to have that piece set, done and set up, right? And then I'm going to have a piece where maybe this is my risky portion, and you know that this is this is fine. I I know that this is going to have potential, you know, above average returns. And if it doesn't work out, it's going to definitely have below average returns, you know. And so, and then it makes it a little, you know, you can bring some levity to it as well, something a little more interesting, knowing that you're solid because you have your plan and you. Don't look at your portfolio on a daily basis when it's a crazy volatile bear market or a crazy volatile bull market, but that there's a steadiness to it. And I think we're all seeking that level of steadiness right now. I find it really interesting what you said, because two weeks ago, three weeks ago, I have clients who they have a portfolio with me, life insurance, annuities, and long-term care. And what's interesting, they also have their own personal slush fund to do exactly what you said. Mm -hmm. So they, a number of them called me up about, I think, and I called them up about three weeks ago. I think we're okay now just to start dabbing into the market. You're looking at the, the NASDAQ 22, lost 22%. You look at other markets down 17%, 18%, so on and so forth. So I told them three weeks ago to just dollar cost average and right. start buying quality companies. Yeah. So this month alone, uh, so in the month of July, I mean, you're looking at the NASDAQ's up 14%. You're looking at the Dow Jones up 6%, S&P 500 up 9%. Now, a stock market is a roller coaster ride. But if you think of it on, on as you said, on to buy on the dip, you don't want to time it. But one of the one of the wonderful things are the two things I always tell my audience is when I speak or, or, or to my clients or my prospect. One, you want to do as much diversification as possible and address as many sectors as you can. Mm -hmm. So that could be growth stocks. It could be bonds. It could be value stocks. It can be real estate. It can be commodities, which could include, for example, gold. The other thing is when I think about all of this is you're looking at that side of it, but you also have to be aware of, as you said before, the market, where it stands and so forth. So if at least you diversify into many sectors, that'll be very much to your advantage. Yeah. I mean, there's, I was just thinking, as you were saying that the, the sectors that I've seen people mention, I mean, obviously like and anybody who's been in energy as a sector this year is like, you know, been able to hedge out maybe the, their tech Correct. was clearly down. And then we get back to, you know, like there's a diversification of an index fund of, of like an S and P. And then for me, this is my totally like personal opinion. And, and it was interesting because it was really reflected in what Howard Mark said. And by no means am I any, I'm not even close to that, but he was saying, you know, if you want average, then buy the average by the index. And then, like you said, there's a slush fund where it's like, well, here's where I can go and try to make some of these outsized returns. And it brings me back to something that I think about often, which is we, the media's influence on our expectations, we really need to temper. Well, A, we need to filter a lot of what we consume from a media perspective, because it can often seem like we have com comparisonitis. Oh, but so and so just tweeted that they made mm, whatever returns, and like the ARC funds are up, whatever they were up last year, and now they've right. crashed. And, and so now they've crashed. You know, and and it's like I don't know. I, we, we, I, like I can't even keep track of it. I don't. I don't want to keep track of it. And so it's like pick one or two things maybe that are you're interested in and play it. Play in those puddles, but your ocean 
is planned for over here and you can like retreat to the safety of your like calm waters but you know when you know when your puddles dry up or or you know when it pours and you know i guess what i'm trying to say is that like the sectors like you said i think those are really important and it's a great way to think about it and then you know there's might be people who are inclined to do a little bit more and then others who are not and then maybe you know in an advisory role you're you're rotating sectors, which I'm sure you are as, I mean, especially when we have Correct. big cyclical changes, like we've just been having and, and like, let the professionals do that. Unless you want to spend a lot of time learning how to do that as a side gig. Correct. And I see that as well. I have some clients who do exactly what you said. They do that as a side gig, mostly people who are retired or people who have a considerable amount of money, of money and that's yeah. their passion. Instead of playing tennis or paddle or whatever, right. this is what they like to do. Yeah. What's interesting too is, and you brought up a point of media. We, I think we all have to keep in mind the following. When I was a little boy, my father sat in the living room and he read three newspapers every night. That's only, that's three newspapers. So most people said that's a lot, right? Yeah. So most people read one newspaper, but he'd read two newspapers in French, one in English. Okay. Now with the advent of social media and mm -hmm. access to a multitude of newspapers and all these different sites where you get information overload, that hits exactly on the head of what you said moments ago. People are overwhelmed with information. And what happens is that it's extremely difficult to do an analysis when you're getting bombarded 25 hours a day, eight days a week. It's just factually an impossibility. And I have seen many people who take all of this in, and you said it perfectly, they talk about comparisons. Here's what I want to share to the audience at hand. People who do well brag about it, but there are far more people who don't do well in the investments who don't say a word. And what does it come from? It comes from one word. It stems from ego. And people who don't do well which is the majority of people, you know, with an investment. And I'm going to give you one quick example. I had a lot of clients calling me over the last, I don't know, pick a number, 12 months. They said, let's do crypto. I said, no, I'm not comfortable. I don't understand it well enough. I'm not sure about it. I don't know. Is it like NFT? Is it a fad? Is it, what is it really? And so a number of them said, okay, I agree with you. A couple a couple of them bought crypto, they lost 40% of their investments. Well, if they were calling you last year, they were also calling you at the top of the market, which makes sense because the, the, that's, kind, that's the one thing that you can actually count on is the sentiment, I think, <laughs> especially, with, especially with things like that. And it's really hard to get something like that right when it's also such early days. I mean, it, that's like a whole other, that's like a whole other conversation. Is it ever? Yeah, but no, but let's, let's switch for, for a few moments. And I really want to give you an opportunity to, to talk about your new book. You wrote a book already, one book called My Wine Guide in 2015. And now this year you're publishing a new book called Womanity, A Tribute to Women in 2022. And we have Women's Equality Day on August 26th. Is that when yes. the book is coming out? This is what I'm hoping for. Okay. Absolutely. Okay, great. Well, tell us about your book. Tell us why you're writing it and why now. So I started writing it five years ago. And what happened is I was doing the women in finance presentation to women. And I said, how could I make it interesting to the audience at hand? What more could I do? So I started looking at incredible women through history. And I found different areas, different sectors to who are the top athletes of the last hundred years and who are the top businesswomen in the last hundred years and who are the most accomplished Native Americans in North America and the African Americans who have done so well and so forth. So all of a sudden, after three weeks of doing these analyses, I wound up with 30 pages of notes. And I said, wait a minute, I wrote this wine book two years prior to that. I said, I'm going to start writing a book about this. And what was interesting is I started writing the book and putting it together, and it involved a lot of research. And while I was writing it, there was hashtag me too that came to be. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, I, and it created a kind of a wave to bring about an impetus to move forward in an accelerated manner. And you're going to say, well, five years, that's a long time. Well, I'm not an author, full-time author. I'm a wealth advisor. So I do it yeah. you know, on weekends and when I can. When that hashtag me too came up, 
everyone who knew about the book said, you have to do this. This is more important, even more so than it was when you started five years ago writing about yeah. this. So I took these notes and I started creating the book and I'm almost done now with it. But what does it talk about the following? And in my mind's eye, before I explain that, this should be one of three books or four books. And I'm going to explain why. I have researched over a thousand women in the last five years, and I selected about 250 to 300 to talk about. But I believe fervently that the next book should have another 250 women, the a book after that, because 250 extraordinary women in a book is just a drop in the bucket of how amazing women are in so many sectors throughout history. So that's number one. Number two, I talk about International Women's Day on March 8th, which is very, very popular in countries where women are not treated particularly well. Yeah. But yeah. when you think of educated, well-to-do nations like the United States, Canada, Western Europe, New Zealand, Australia, they don't really celebrate International Women's Day that mm -hmm. much. And for mm -hmm. me, that's very sad. Yeah. When I lived in Asia, I traveled throughout Latin America for business for many years. March 8th was always celebrated, and it was a big, big to-do. You see it also in Eastern Europe. You see it in Central Europe. Yeah. You see it in Africa. It's truly celebrated at the level it should be celebrated at. And I want the audience of my book, and I want people in the United States and these other countries to celebrate International Women's Day and to honor women as they should be. Now, Equality Day is a day that's more of an American day, if you will, to celebrate women, which I think is wonderful. But in my book, I talk about both days because I think they're worthy to be highlighted for the audience at hand. Yeah. I also spent a lot of time working with a lawyer in Connecticut who was, is very involved in the Equal Rights Amendment. And I have a chapter on that because to me, it's absolutely critical that we talk about the ERA today, and hopefully that we'll get it on the federal level to celebrate women in a legal way, if you will. Yeah. And then finally, I, taught, I have a chapter on quotations of these incredible women. I think I read 1,200 quotations. I think I selected something like 150, all mm -hmm. by women, all extraordinary, amazing, amazingly powerful. And then the last thing is I have a section on the qualities of a leader, which is mm -hmm. everyone talks about that, but I changed it. I hear often people say, oh, guess what? You need these three qualities to be a leader. And I go, this is silliness. I think of the DNA of a human being. I think of women being excelling in so many areas. And I selected 25 qualities and the chapter is called the 25 qualities of a leader with compassion. Because mm -hmm. today we need compassion more than ever, I believe anyway. And so I wanted to have not only leadership as it stands, but I wanted to bring about the concept of compassion and empathy, because I don't think they have to be excluded from leadership at all. And women have that gift to have the compassion and the empathy and the leadership. And we see it all over the world with prime ministers and Scandinavian countries. We see, we see leadership in, in, in all the courts. We see leadership in the business world. And I have, a, I have a very strong belief that if there were more women leaders of countries throughout the world, I think the world would be one, a better place. And I think it would be a little bit of a softer place in terms of basically pathos. And I think that's very important. So my quote, my quote for, the, for my book is, thanks to women, there is equality. That is, that's the author's quote, I quotation, and I use that throughout the book. And I believe also the Chinese proverb thank, that, that states, women hold up, have the sky, has to be highlighted. And I think that kids, ladies, young women in high school should be aware of this because I think it'll help them on a long-term basis. And in line with what we talked about, it really has to do with the horizon in front of them. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your book. <laughs> I've been reading it and, and for, for bringing this forward, for bringing forward 
the qualities and the women themselves. And like you said, 250 isn't, isn't that many. And we know that there are multiple multitudes more that were forgotten or buried or ignored throughout historical texts. We know who writes history. And so just Thank you. I know gratitude is one of the 25 qualities that, yes, that, that you picked. And you know, there I, I've heard a lot more people use that word in the past few years. And I feel like a lot of these qualities that you listed, they are coming forward. There's change happening in the world. And I'm so excited for your book to come out. And I hope that it helps to spark more awareness of Women's Equality Day to turn it into something greater. When I lived in Europe, international, I didn't know what International Women's Day was until I moved there. And then it was this yes. great big thing. And then I moved back here and, and I'm like, where are my little mimosas? Where are my flowers? Where's, you know, where's the yellow? Like, and so, and it isn't like, I, I know what you mean. It's interesting that you said that because I, I actually experienced that here and then just to do it on a daily basis. And so it's yes. great to meet allies like you that, that are out there because it's important for everyone to know. And I, and I say this all the time to people, this isn't about one over the other. I mean, this is about all of us. This is about the equality. Like you said, I mean, we have to, and there are many of us that are working really hard, you and me. And there's so many people that I know, and I keep meeting on a daily basis that have a goal to put more wealth, which is power into more women's hands, because that's how we change the world is we need to start with this shift of power, with the shift of resources and the way that we as women will allocate resources. I've met billionaires who have said we need to mint more women billionaires so that they can go out and replicate and do and make these changes. And so I'm always energized and just so grateful to meet more people like you that are out there that are doing this work. So that was a very long way of saying thank you. Well, Adapia, thank you to you very much for your time. And you and I talked about this, but my foundation is called Womanity Four, the number four wise and wise is women investing for social equality. Mm -hmm. And it has to do with the social side to your point but it also has to do with the independence of women with regards to the, the, the purse spring so that we can bring everything, bind it together with a, you know, tie with a red bow and bring it all together so that I know fundamentally in my heart that if we continue on this track, the world will be a better place. I believe that we're going to get there. I think I believe so too. <laughs> and that's not the hopium that, you know, I'm going to stick my head in the sand about it and, and hope that like my portfolio will be okay. It's like the true in my heart, true deep hope that I see playing out in front of me. And there's more and more people being activated. And, and I know that a lot of the people that listen to my podcast or that they, you know, that follow me that they know, and there's this coalescence. And so it's such an honor and a pleasure to introduce you to them and to all the people that, that I know. So with that, I will ask you the final question, which, which I ask all my guests and very simply, what does wealth mean to you? To me, I always say to my, I have two boys. I always tell them to me, wealth is my health is my wealth. That to me has become more and more obvious as I get older. Wealth to me are my two boys that they are everything to me. Wealth to me is happiness and working on becoming even happier as an individual. But wealth to me is also very much giving. And I feel much richer as an individual when I can give to individuals to, and when I can do my wine tastings and donate the money to homes for battered women. Yeah. When I can do a women in finance presentation and I see my audience nodding and saying, I get it now. And it benefits them because my end goal in life as a wealth advisor, I want to help as many people as possible to retire in comfort and with dignity. Yes, that's beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you very Thank you. much for your Thanks time. Thanks so much for coming on the show. And we're going to include links to everything, to your book, to Womanity for Wise. And, you know, for those that are listening that might know, not see the show notes, what is the best way for people to reach you? If anyone wants you, you can call me or you can email me. But should I adopt you, give my email address? If, you know, if you're comfortable doing so, and we can include it in the show notes as well, but you know, maybe that way they know where to find you. Sure. Sure. So the best way to contact me, I think would be just on my personal email. It's G M. So G M S as in Sam, T as in Thomas, C as in Charlie, Y as in Yankee, R as in Romeo 
at comcast.net. Perfect. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Have a nice evening. Thanks for tuning in to Real Wealth, Real Health. We hope that you've enjoyed today's episode and found it both informative and insightful. We welcome all your questions and your feedback about today's episode. And especially, we welcome your questions about specific topics that you would like us to cover. So shoot us an email at podcast at alpha i.com. And if you have a moment, we really appreciate ratings and reviews as it helps us grow our online community and our interactions with you. And we'll also be linking to a number of relevant articles on topics that we might have touched on during our conversations. Some of them are broad, some of them are technical, but we're always aiming to provide information that helps you better understand the mechanics of building this healthy financial foundation, especially if you're looking to do this with real estate. 